Hello guys, today I'm here with a new book of Sudha Murthy Grandma's Bag of Stories. So let's get started. Story number one, the beginning of the stories. Summer holidays, Ajji smiled to herself as she waited for two more of her grandchildren to arrive. Raghu and Minu would be here soon. Anand and Krishna had already arrived with their mother the previous evening. They had been waiting restlessly for their cousins to arrive ever since. Even though Ajji told them Raghu and Minu would be here the next morning, these two kids just would not listen. They went to the railway station with their grandfather Ajja to receive them. The train must have pulled into tiny station of the Shigon by now and their grandfather would have hired a taxi to bring them home with their mother and the stacks of luggage. Ajji hurried through her bath. She had finished cooking their favorite dishes and were now wearing a nice soft cotton sari before going to the veranda for waiting them. There, they they came. What a noise children were making. They all nearly tumbled out of the car and came leaping and shouting to her, each wanting to be first hugged by Ajji. Each one was wanted to be closest to the Ajji. Soon the children settled down. A visit to Ajji house meant first inspecting the garden to see how much the plants have grown since they last came. Then they went to check on cows, calves, dog, pups, cats and kittens. Then they all ate huge quantity of Ajji's delicious food. Finally, while their mother went off to chat and rest, the children gathered around their mother for the being the best part of the holidays, listening to her wonderful stories, particularly in the late afternoon. Let us too gathered in the fast revolving fan on a mat on the floor fighting to be nearest to her and listening. Story number one, Doctor, Doctor. The first day, the children ask, Ajji, how do you many stories do you know? Ajji smiled and answered, My grandmother told me many stories. Some I read in the book, a few I learned from the youngsters like you. The rest from your Ajja. Then Ajji paused and said, I see all of you have grown a lot since the last time I saw you. So before I start telling any story, I want to know what each of you want to become when you grow up. Raghu, who was of 11 years old and the oldest of all, said immediately, I want to be an environment scientist. Minu, who was of 9, said, I have not decided, maybe a computer person like my dad. Anand, who was of 10, said, I want to be an astronaut and his twin sister Krishna firmly said I want to become a fashion designer. Ajji smiled. I'm glad of all your thoughts about this. We should always have some aim in life in which we must try to achieve while being of help to others. Now tell me, let me tell you a story about a person who learns this lesson. Shall we too join Ajji and her gang of young friends and hear the story? Story On a blazing hot summer afternoon, an old man came walking down a narrow village path. He was tired and thirsty. Right by the road, he spotted a tiny grocery store. It had a tin roof and a mud walls. The shopkeeper sat inside, fanning himself and shooing away the flies that were buzzing around in the stifling heat. There was a little bench in front of the store where villagers met when evening and the land had cooled down. The old man flopped down on the bench. He was so tired while he could not speak. Finally, he opened his mouth and uttered one word, Water! Now, this village had been facing a horrible problem for a long time. It was a great desert and the rain came once, only once a year to fill its pond and wells. But the rains had disappeared for the last two years and the villagers had been making to do with water from a faraway stream. Every morning, groups of men and women walked a long distance, filled their pots from the little stream and used that the whole day. Naturally, no one wanted to waste even a drop of this precious water. Yet, how do you say no to a thirsty, tired old man? 
When he asks for a water without a second thought, the shopkeeper Ravi, who was a very kind-hearted, poured out a tumbler of water from his pot and gave it to the old man. The man drank it up greedily. Then he said one more word, more, and without waiting for Ravi's to give him, he lunged for the pot, picked it up, and lifting it to his lips, drank up Ravi's entire day's supply of water. Poor Ravi, what he could do? He just stared in a dismay. Then he told himself, "Never mind. After all, I did help someone in need." The stranger, meanwhile, now feel, seemed to feel better. He handed the pot back to Ravi and gave a smile that filled Ravi's heart with warmth and said, "My son, always be kind like this. Help everyone who comes to you like you helped me, and you will be blessed." Then he picked up his stick and slowly hobbled down the road. Ravi watched the strange old man disappear into the distance. Then he returned to his shop. The afternoon heat grew worse with a headache. His lips were parched and his throat hurted. It was so dry. He really needed a drink of water, but the visitor had finished it up all, hoping to coax a drop of water or two out of the pot. Ravi lifted it to his lips and tilted it. Imagine his surprise when a gush of water ran down his face. It was sweet, refreshing. Water, which only quenched the, his thirst, but he wiped out his headache too. Ravi was staring at the pot, trying to figure out what just happened. When Karim limped to his shop, Karim was a young man who had hurt his leg in an accident many years ago, which had left him with a limp. When he was unwell or tired, his limp became worse. Karim too flopped down on the bench in the front of the store and caught his breath. Like the old man, when the, he finished out shopping list from pocket and handed to it Ravi, as Ravi started packing up the item listed on the paper, Karim opened a little bundle of food and ate his lunch sitting on the bench. Finally, he wiped his mouth in a scarf and pointed to Ravi's pot of water. Mind if I take a little sip? It's so after all. Ravi was busy measuring out some dal. He said without looking up. I would be happy to offer you some, but someone had already most of it. Then I was feeling unwell and thinked, I think I finished a lot of it. What are you saying, my friend? I can see clearly the pot brimming over with water. Ravi looked up in and stared at it in disbelief. In front of his eyes, Karim poured out a tumbler full of water and drank it. Then he paid for all his groceries and left the store. Did his limp look as if or is nearly gone? Ravi watched him for a while, trying to figure out. Then decided the heat was playing tricks on his mind, and went back into the cool comfort of his shop and dozed off. He woke with a start as someone was calling his name urgently. He opened his eyes to find Kareem back. This time he was holding by the hand his sister, little sister Fatima. Brother, wake up! We need your help. Karim asked, oh, what? Is something wrong? Fatima is burning up with fever. Then go to a doctor. Why have you got her to a sh grocery shop? Karim stared at him and said, You mean you don't know how you just helped me? My leg, which has been troubling me for the last 20 years, helped healed upon its own as soon as I drank the water from your magic pitcher. Give Fatima a drink from it too. I am sure her fever will disappear in no time. Ravi was astonished. Magic pitcher? Healing water? What Karim was going on about? Nonetheless, he passed the pot to Fatima. She drank a bit, then she sat down to rest. Within minutes, she lifted her head and said, It is true, brother. I am indeed cured of the fever. Soon the news spread in the village like wildfire. Ravi, the quiet, kind grocery storekeeper, was now the owner of a magic pitcher, the waters from which could heal anyone of any disease. Every night, Ravi left the pitcher in the store, and in the morning, it would fill with her brim, brim with sweet, cool water. Daily, a queue of sick people and their relative collected in front of his shop. To each one, Ravi gave a drink of the water, and then when they went away, saying they were now better. 
The pot was never empty. Ravi realized that old man had helped him, given him this gift in gratitude. Ravi understood what a great gift it was and thanked him daily in his mind. Soon, his little store turned into a hospital. Ravi did not charge a paisa for a water. People would have some money, some gifts for him, and others did not pay him anything, but he was still happy with that. One day, a rich landlord's servant appeared at his doorstep and said, My master is unwell. Come with me and give him a drink of water. Ravi replied, See the crowd of the people behind you, waiting for their turn. How can I live, live without helping them and go to you, master? Do you think these sick people can stand in the sun for a long? Tell your master to come to me instead and I will give him the water here. The servant said, Ravi, what will you get by helping them? A few rupees? Some rice and dal? Come to my master's house. He will shower you with money and gifts. Your worries about making and never meet and over of at least a month. Ravi was tempted. It was true. Why not cure a rich man and get some help in buying his daily needs? Ravi told the people waiting outside to come back and the next day and went with the servant to the landlord. Slowly in this way Ravi changed. Where once he could not bear to these the pain and sadness of the sick poor people, he now started each day hoping that he would get one rich patient at least who would pay him handsomely. Days passed thus, season changed and it was summer once more. Ravi was in his old store writing up his accounts when the voice of an old man quavered in his ear. Son, water! Startled, he looking up, was it the same old man who had given him the gift of the magic picture? But right behind the visitor was none other than the king messenger. Come quickly! The messenger shouted. The queen has been bitten with a bite of bitten by a mosquito. Water! The old man repeated. The queen is ill and well. The messenger shouted again. Ravi looked from one to another. One was grubby old man who may or may not be the same person who gave him the picture. On the other side, a messenger from the king himself. He pictured the gold coin showering down on him once healing water soothed the queen mosquito bite. The choice was clear. He picked up his picture and said to the stranger, Wait right here, uncle, I'll back be soon. The king's swift-footed horse took him to the palace. There he rushed to the queen who was staring in dismay at the mosquito's bites on her arm. He tilted the pitcher to pour some water into a tumbler, but nothing came. Again and again, he tilted the pitcher. He turned it upside down and stared into depth. It was dry as a bone. You cheat! The king roared. So this is how you have been fooling the people of my kingdom? Get out and never let me hear that you have acquired magical healing power. If you claim such a thing, I will banish you from forever from the village. Then he turned to comfort his queen, who was splashing tears on the bump on her arm. Ravi slowly backed, uh, walked back to his village. He went to his shop. No one was there. He searched for the old man who had asked for the water. He was nowhere to be seen. He called out, Uncle, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Please do come, I'll give you water. But there was no reply. Now he realized this was the same old man whom he met yet a, a year back. He remembered the people he had healed once out of kindness and compassion and how much they had blessed and loved him in return. He remembered their acts of generosity, sparing him a few coins and a bundle of vegetables from their garden in return for the water. When did it become so selfish and that he would neglect the people who had needed him the most? The old man had taken back his powers when sensed Ravi had misused the gift. Never mind, Ravi smiled to himself. He would use the money he had received for the water to help bring a real doctor in the village, someone who helped the people with his knowledge of medicine and diseases, so that they need not to wait for a magician to cure them for the illness. From the day onwards, Ravi filled his pitcher with ordinary water from the stream and carried it back carefully to his little store and waited for the old man. Maybe one day he would back, but till then, Ravi was determined to bring a real medicine man to his village. 
Ajji finished her stories and looked around the four little faces around her. Raghu was in deep thought. Ajji smiled at him. The children shouted, "Ajji, tell one more story." "Aha," Ajji said. "Too many stories a day are not good either. One laddu is very sweet, very delicious, but if you feel all the laddus at the time, it's no fun. Go and play outside. Tomorrow I will tell you another stories." With that, she got up and went to the kitchen to supervise the dinner. Story number 2, Kaveri and the Thief. The children had gone with their ajja to the paddy fields that morning. They were all city kids and did not know a thing about farming. On the way, Anand was surprised to see a bird's nest on the top of the tree. He said to ajja, "I wonder how birds decide where and how to make their nests." Ajja said, "The straw in the nest is from paddy field." Do you know farming helps human beings as well as birds Krishna replied Ajja I thought wheat and rice can be just plucked plucked from trees like mangoes but today I realized there is no much work in farming That afternoon after lunch when they gathered around Ajji for the day's story she looked sharply at the children they had all enjoyed learning about farming activities like cleaning seeds and separating the straw from the paddy in the city everything came from the supermarket but here they had seen how the things were really produced ajji said farming is very important if farmers do not grow any food what will we all eat anand said thoughtfully if farmers do such important work why they are so poor That's true my dear Ajji sighed fanning herself Of course there are rich farmers too people who own lots of land but many in our country till small piece of land and they make less money Then seeing at the kids crushed fallen faces she put down her fan sat up and said but I can tell you of a story of poor f- farmer woman who did not remain very poor all due to her sharp wit tell ajji do tell the kids yelled so ajji started her story story kaveri's lazy husband annoyed her no end there she was working like a donkey in the fields ploughing and watering and tending a hard dry piece of land while her husband snored away happily at home why once when a stranger came asking for some food and water He just pointed towards the kitchen and went back to sleep. The stranger thankfully was an honest man and took only enough for himself and his horse. Not that there was much to steal ka in Kaveri's little house. There were poor farmers with only a patch of land where nothing seemed to grow. Somehow Kaveri tilled the land, did some odd jobs in the neighborhood and made ends meet. The land was right next to a temple. On some days her husband would come along with her on the pretext of helping her but no sooner would her back be turned than she would find him stretched out near the temple courtyard gossiping with passing villagers. One day she was working in the field trying to dig up the ground so she could sow some seeds a thin man with a big mustache appeared beside her. He was a thief. and not up to good kaveri of course did not know this she greeted him politely and went back to her work now the thief wanted to steal the coins that were given as offering in the temples and perhaps even the ornaments idol the only way into the temple was by digging his way from in way in from kaveri's land but how he could do anything there with a stuff no nonsense woman working there guessing kaveri was hard up for money he whispered to her sister why are you working so hard on the barren land i will give you 1000 rupees sell it to me kaveri raised her eyebrows why did he wanted to buy the land for so much money surely something was wrong the thief sensed she was not about to sell to him So he raised his price: a thousand and fifty. No, two thousand. No, again five thousand. No. Kaveri kept shaking her head. 
She did not like this odd looking man who was offering her so much money for the field. Clearly, he had some evil plans. Finally, to keep him quiet, she made up a story. I will never sell this land. You see, it belongs to my ancestors. Now we are poor, but I am told that once our family was very rich. Though we lost a lot of our money, much of it was also buried here in this field by one ancestor to keep it safe from robbers. Then when people forgot about it for years and years, my husband found a clue to the location of hidden treasure just a few days back. Why do you think I am digging this hard earth not to sow seeds? Oh no, that's just what everyone thinks. I am actually looking for the hidden treasure. The thief was stunned. He felt this woman was really innocent, giving him such important information to a stranger. He thought, why should I not take the advantage of this situation? Here he was, hoping to steal a few coins from the temple and this woman was telling him about the hidden treasure. He replied in a very humble way. Yes, sister, I understand. After all, it's your family treasure. Only you should get it. He pretended to walk away and went and hid himself a little way down the road. Night fell, Kaveri packed up her tools and headed towards the home. The temple too emptied out and the priest locked it up for the night. Then at midnight, when all was quiet and the night creatures were coming out of their homes, the thief crept into the field. All night he dug and dug, looking for the treasure. But of course, there was no sign of it as there had never had been any treasure to begin with. By the time dawn broke and he realized Kaveri had made a fool of him, all he could do now was get away from the field fast. When Kaveri reached the field, she grinned to herself. Just as she had expected, the thief had spent the night digging up the land nicely for her. All she needed to do now was sow the seeds. She worked hard in the fields for the next few months and managed to grow a good crop. She sold those and finally they had some money. With a part of this money, Kaveri bought some jewelry. Many months later, the thief decided to show his face in the village again. He was careful to disguise himself though. He trimmed his long moustache, tied a colorful turban and pretended to be a traveling salesman. No sooner had he stepped into the village than he saw Kaveri going about to her work, but what is this? Instead of the simple unadorned lady he saw last year, she was now wearing jewelry which looked as thought if he'd been in the family for years. Surely uh, she must have located that missing treasure finally. He was determined to look in her house and find the rest of her money and the treasure. That night, he appeared at Kaveri's house and said to her husband, I am a traveler and I don't have a place to spend the night. Please give me a shelter for the night. Kaveri's husband agreed immediately. Kaveri, however, glimpsed at the man from inside the house and saw through his disguise. She knew he must be planning some robbery, so she said in a loud voice, making sure the visitor heard, Oh dear, your dear aunt is all alone in the night and asked us to come stay with her. You know how the dark scares her when uncle is not there. Come, let us go there for the night. Then lowering her voice a bit, yet making sure she was heard clearly, she continued, Don't worry about the jewels. I have hidden them in a little hole in the house of walls. No one will suspect the hiding spot. Then she came out in her normal voice and told the thief, Brother, you can sleep in the veranda. The house will be locked. Here is some food and water for you. We will come tomorrow morning. The thief smiled to himself at Kaveri's foolishness. Her husband, meanwhile, stared at her an open mouth, wondering which aunt she was talking about and what jewels she was talking about. When she firmly walked off, he followed her obediently. The thief could not believe his luck. He had an entire night to comb through the house, tap all the walls and look for the hidden stash of gold ornaments. So he started, started, tap, 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 kick, punch, shove. He prowled and he tapped. He kicked and he pushed the walls, hoping to spot the jewels. Finally, he tore down all the walls. But of course, there was nothing he could find. 
Exhausted, he fell asleep and woke only with the crowing of cock, cock as the sun rose. Quickly, he found his little bundle of things and ran away. Within minutes, Kaveri and her husband returned. Oh, Kaveri, see what the bad man has done to our house. You gave him food and shelter and made me come with you, leaving the man alone in the night. Her husband wailed, but Kaveri was smiling. Then she broke into peals of laughter and said, Don't worry, I had planned all this all along. You see, I saved money from our last crop to rebuild the house. I needed to call in some laborers to help tear it down. But our guest has done it for us. Now we can make a larger house for ourselves just the way we always wanted. The whole villagers heard the story and started marveling at her intelligence. Many months flew by, the thief was burning to take revenge. How dare that village woman trick him, that too not once but twice. He realized that she was very clever. One day, he dressed up as a bangle seller and started wandering in the village. Kaveri spotted him and knew who he was at once. She said to her friends who were crowding around the bangle seller, Oh dear, I would have loved to get some for myself, but ever since that good-for-nothing thief tried to steal all our money by tearing down our house, I have hidden everything in a little hole in a tree in the woods. Which tree? Her friend asked. Oh no, I'm not saying which tree, but it is at a last safe and sound in the forest. The thief looked at her. Yes, Kaveri was wearing an ordinary sari with no ornaments at all. Her friends turned around in astonishment as the crash with which bangle seller flung down his collection of bangle made off for the forest. Only Kaveri watched with a grin on her face. Out in the forest, the thief searched high and low for the jewels. He climbed up the trees, poked around in bushes, got bitten, scratched and growled at, but he would not give up. The jewels were somewhere and he had to find them. So that is where we leave him. we will leave him prowling around in the forest looking for money and gold that don't belong to her. Everyone praised Kaveri for her quick wit in ridding the village of the thief. She continued to work hard and made more money from her farming and became rich old lady. Even her husband was shamed into giving up his lazy ways and helping her. As for the thief, who knows, perhaps he is still in that forest looking for what was never his. Now, if only he had learned to work hard like Kaveri, he would have been as rich. The children laughed and laughed when the story was over. The poor thief, Menu and Krishna giggled. Maybe he got eaten by a tiger. Ajji grinned. See, she told Anand. Sometimes with a bit of luck and lots of pluck, people can change any situation which they find themselves. Story number three, who was the happiest of them all? Minu was upset. She pouted and sulked and would not talk to Ajji. But how can any child be angry with Ajji for a very long? The grandmother was just too loving and affectionate for anyone to not tell her what she was wrong. Ajji, it's been three days and you have not told a story about the king yet. Minu grumbled. Ajji nodded. It's true, Minu. That was my fault. I should have told you a st- good, nice king who does good, nice things for his people, not horrible things like punishing them and jailing them. Minu sat straight and demanded, All right, dear, he is a king just as you wanted. And Ajji began her story. The story. King Amrit loved his people and looked after the affairs of his kingdom well. His minister, Chandan, was a wise man who helped the king in in his work tirelessly. One day, King Amrit and Chandan were talking walk on the terrace on the palace. The terrace offered beautiful views of the surrounding and they could see far into distance. They spotted the weekly market from up there with people in colorful clothes buying and selling all kinds of things. There was a plenty to buy and people had money to buy too. There were, there were no poor people to be seen anywhere. The king watched with a smile on his face. He was delighted to see the prosperity of his kingdom. Like any good ruler, he was happy when his people were happy. 
He turned to Chandan and said, See how contented my people are, but I want to check this first hand by talking to them. Tomorrow, summon people from all walks to life in the court. I will ask themself, myself, how they are doing. Chandan was used to the king's strange request, so he nodded and went off to carry out his order. The next day, the king arrived in the court, humming a happy tune to himself. Seeing all the people gathered there waiting for him, he was even more pleased. He cleared his throat and said in a loud, pleased, loud voice, I have called you here to ask you a very important question. As your king, I need to know if all of you are contented. Do you have enough for your needs? Do you know anyone who is not happy about anything? The citizens looked at each other, thought for a while, and slowly, one by one, they came forward to answer. One after others, they all said how happy they were. Their kitchens had enough food, their trades, business were doing very well. The king made them feel safe. The farmers had grown good crop and the river ponds were full of fish. What more could they can ask for? The king became more and more pleased as he heard this. Only Chandan, his minister, watched and heard everything with a frown on his face. Why? What was wrong? Soon he walked up to the king and whispered something in his ear. King Amrit's eyebrows rose up in astonishment. Surely Chandan could not be serious, but he looked at the minister's face and found no trace of being this in a joke. He turned back to the court and made a most unusual announcement. I am delighted that all of you have said you are happy, but I want to test this. Tomorrow I want all the happy people of this kingdom to come and meet me in the royal gardens. But I have a condition. All of you have to enter the garden from the main gate, walk across and meet me by the gate near the rear of the garden. I will wait for you there. When you enter the garden, you will be given a sack and each of you can pick up whatever fruits or flowers you heart desire. An excited buzz broke out among the crowd. It sounded like a lot of fun. No one was usually allowed to enter King's special garden. He had planted the trees from all over the world in that garden and it was said to be filled with all kind of beautiful and strange plants. Right on the time, next day, everyone gathered at the gate of the gardens. At the time, the king had told them the guards opened the gates and handed out the sacks. Mean men and women and children started roaming around the beautiful garden. They spotted juicy apples and plump mangoes hanging from the trees. They picked these till they saw ripe pomegranates bursting with the juice, grapes and colorful flowers no one had seen before. People went about picking whatever they wished for and filling with their sacks with them. But as they walked further into the garden, it became wild, wilder, more like a forest, and there they saw trees laden with apple of gold, mangoes of silver, and flowers studded with gems and jewels. Everyone emptied their sacks of the fruits they had collected earlier and started madly filling them up with these precious fruits and flowers. They all forgot with these precious fruits. Uh, they had said that they had more than enough for their needs at home. Greed took over their minds and all they could think was about adding more and more valuables to their sacks. The fruits which they had picked earlier had tasted to be as sweet as nectar now lay in heaps around the garden, forgotten and left to rot. Then with their sacks filled right to the top, the citizens made their way to the rear gate of the garden where the king was waiting. But what was this? To their astonishment, they found a raging, raging steam stopping their way. Water gushed down from behind some rocks and rushed over pe pebbles and big boulders through the garden. The stream was narrow, but the current was strong. There was no boats to take the people across. Clearly, the only way was to swim. But how could they swim with such heavy sacks filled with gold and silver fruits? The people stood by the stream for a long time and scratching their heads. Then one young man what they all needed to be done. He simply abandoned his sacks by the stream, waded into the water, then his sack swam across the other side. Slowly the others too followed the suit. 
Sadly, some whaling industries, they left their sacks filled with what they had thought was the riches of a lifetime and dived into the stream. Then they walked up to their king and happy and angry. King Amrit and Chandan watched them trudge up in their soaking clothes. Chandan was a smile, a smile on his lips while the king looked sad. When they had assembled in front of him, he said, When I asked you the yesterday if you were happy with your lives, all of you said you were contented and did not need anything. Yet today, I can see the sadness in your face when you have to leave behind riches you had gathered in my garden. If you if you were really happy with your lives, why did you gather the jewel fruits and why are you so sad by now? Everyone looked down ashamed to their behavior. Only the young man who was the first to cross the stream after leaving his sacks behind seemed to be unconcerned. Chandan spotted his cheerful face in the crowd and beckoned him forward. Then he asked, Tell me, why are you not sad? You have to leave behind so much of wealth that suddenly came in your way. The man said, I didn't, the pay, I didn't pick the jewel, jeweled fruits and the flowers. I had picked some of the lovely tasty fruits and had eaten my fill of them. In my sack, I have kept some other for my little daughter who was at home. I had thought she would enjoy tasty apple and mangoes, but when I saw I was uh, no other way to go across the stream, I did not think twice about leaving my sack behind the river. My little girl can get tasty fruit from some other garden too but i am happy that king let us wander around his garden looking at the trees and plants and animals he is a great king king for having created this palace of beauty and it was a pleasure walking around there finally a smile appeared on the um, king amrit's face and chandan turned to him and said your majesty i hope you now realize that people's contentment do not end with having enough food or money they also need to be truly happy inside. Only then, they will, then will they not be swayed when they gain or lose wealth. That is the lesson that everyone, whether a king or a commoner, needs to remember. The king nodded as he did his subjects. This was a lesson they would not forget in a hurry. Did you like this story, Minu? Raghu asked. Oh yes, Minu nodded. But I like the minister more than the king. That's true, Minu, Aji agreed. Kings need intelligent minister to show them the right path sometimes. Remember, Akbar and Birbal and Krishna Dev Rai had Tenali Ram. Why just kings? We all need someone to tell if us what we are doing is wrong. It could be our parents, grandparents, teacher or even our best friends. The important thing is to listen to them and change our ways when needed. Story number 4 The Enchanted Scorpions What an exciting morning the children had that day. Ajja had asked for their help in cleaning up his old storeroom. Ajja loved to keep all kinds of old things in the room, much to Ajji's annoyance. She firmly believed that the room was principal attraction for all the cockroaches, mice, termites and other such bugs in the house. Every summer holiday, the children spent a day clearing out the room, exclaiming over all the treasure they had unearthed. Aja even let them keep off some odds and ends they found. That didn't please their mothers too much though. Today, they had found an old wooden box. It was a big box, beautifully carved oval with flowers and vines and leaves. Inside it, it had little compartments to keep all manner of things. Now, these compartments were empty but Raghu, who had been reaching Treasure Island, imagined that once these, full, these were full of gold and silver coins, gems as big as eggs and all kind of fantastic jewelry. After examining the box truly, the children decided that the day's story had to be about to lost the treasure. Aji, who knew a story about anything under the sun, started right away. The story Siddharth was a young and good-natured merchant. Looking for work, he arrived in a village. 
He liked the people of the village so much that he decided to use all his savings, buy a house and live there forever. While searching for a house, he met Uday. Uday was a poor man. His family had once been extremely wealthy landowners but were not so well off. Uday was looking to sell his old family mansion in order to pay off his family loans. Siddharth loved the house. Uday showed him the him and bought it immediately. Then he set about repairing the mansion which was in ruins as he dug out the old flooring. He found a sealed box buried underground. When he opened it to his surprise he saw it was filled with scorpions. He flung the box right away. In fright that evening he went to visit the wisest man in the village and asked him about the box of scorpions the wise man thought for a while and then said perhaps its uday's ancestor hid some money in that box and buried it to be used when someone in the family needed the money over the year they must have forgotten about the existence of the box siddharth was still puzzled but the box contained scorpions he said not money the old man smiled the box is protected by an old spell if it is opened by anyone other other than the family member it will appear as if it is swarming with scorpions only a true family member will be able to see that box contains money siddharth was sad to hear this story he remembered the tears that sprung up in uday's eyes as he had looked back at his ancestral house for one last time before leaving the village if only he had known about the hidden treasure he would not have to sell the house when siddharth reached home he decided to keep the box safely till someone from uday's family came to claim it to make sure that the box was taken only by true descendant of uday's family He took four scorpions from the box and hung them in the four corners of his newly opened shop. All his customers would comment when they entered the shop. Siddharth, are you mad? Why you have hung dangerous insects in your shop? Do you want to scare away shoppers? Siddharth would only smile. He knew his goods were the best of for miles around and people when come to his shop at his store scorpions or not gradually the shop came to be known as scorpion shop and the villagers laughed at him behind his back but siddharth did not care many years passed by and siddharth was now a middle aged man with a wife and children and enough money but he had one regret no one had came to claim that box one day a young boy walked into the shop and said Sir, I have heard from many people in the village that you are wealthy and often help those in need. I had to stop going to school because I could no longer pay my fees. Could you please lend me some money so that I can finish my study? Siddharth shook his head sadly. The villagers have exaggerated about my wealth, he said. Yes, I am earning enough, but not so much that I can help you or lend you money. though i would have loved to do so the boy flared up in anger when he heard this sir if you don't want to help me please say no openly why do you lie you have so much money that you don't know what to do with why else you have you hung gold coins in four corner of your shop surely you can spare some coins to help a poor student like me siddharth stared at him in astonishment oh, what you said what you did just now said he asked his eyes bulging in excitement i said if you don't want to help the boy repeated yes yes i heard that siddharth cut him short but what did you say about after that about the gold coins in my shop the boy was looking at siddharth doubtfully afraid that perhaps this excited old man was a bit mad i said you are so wealthy that you have hung gold coins in the four corners of the shop there they are for the world to see and the boy pointed to what appeared to siddharth as four writhing scorpions siddharth gave a happy whoop of laughter he rushed forward and hugged the box 
आर यू रिलेटेड टू उदय कमल अकार डिड योर फैमिली एवर लिव इन दिस विलेज ही नियरली शाउटेड इन द बॉयज ईयर द यंग मैन स्टेप्ड बैक इन अलार्म पर द रिच मैन वॉज मैड एंड डेंजरस आफ्टर ऑल ये ये येस माई नेम इज उदय आई वॉज नेम्ड आफ्टर माई ग्रैंड फादर हिज फैमिली लिव्ड हेयर फॉर मैनी जनरेशन देन वेन दे फेल ऑन हार्ड टाइम्स माई ग्रैंड फादर सोल्ड दिस ओल्ड हाउस एंड मूवड ही नेवर रिकवर्ड फ्रॉम द ग्रीफ ऑफ हैविंग टू सेल द एंसेस्ट्रल प्रॉपर्टी एंड डाइड हार्ड ब्रोकन सिद्धार्थ वाइब अवे द ट्रियर्स फ्रॉम हिज आईज वेट हेयर माई सन He said, rushing to the house, he came back with an old box and gave it to young boy. Go on, open it and tell me what you see. He chuckled. The boy opened the box and his eyes nearly fell out of his head, for he held in his hand more than treasure than he could dream about in his wildest fantasies. The box was filled up with gold and silver jewels. He looked up in astonishment at Siddharth, who was grinning broadly. Yes it belongs to you Siddharth explained I have held it safe for many years hoping someone from Uday's family will come to claim it Your troubles are now over Go home use the wealth of your ancestor judiciously and do well in life Then he told the boy the story how he had found the box which appears to be filled with scorpions to anyone who did not belong to Uday's family Uday was amazed when he heard the story. He offered Siddharth half his wealth in gratitude, but Siddharth would hear none of it. This is yours, he insisted. Go and enjoy your life. Uday went away with the box and all his life he remembered the funny, honest old man who had kept his wealth safely for him. How lovely, Ajji! Krishna gasped. If only we had such a shopkeeper in this town. All the children agreed that there would have been such fun. Ajji laughed at their dreamy face. Then she shooed them out to play in the garden, and do you know what they played till late in evening? Treasure hunt, of course. Story number five: The Horse Trap. The next day, there was a surprise summer shower. The land smelled beautiful. The thirsty earth had soaked in every drop of rainwater. The children had been very busy shifting the puppies and the kittens who were roaming in the back and the front yards into the house so that they did not get drenched in the rain. Their respective mother were busy shifting the puppdoms left to dry on the terrace. Summer is the season when under Ajji's leadership pickles and puppdoms were made. Minu started a calculation. Everyone needs at least 5 pappadams per day. For next one month, 600 pappadams will be needed. Tomorrow our neighbor Vishnu Kaka three grandchildren are coming. They will also eat here these tasty pappadams. We may have to keep 5 per head. That means Ajji has to prepare 600 plus 50 pappadams. When Ajji listened to the mathematics, she laughed and said, Don't calculate that way. It may be true today that we will eat all five pappadams a day, but this may not be true for every day. After eating for pappadam three day, one may get bored. There is a wedding in my brother's house, and we all might go there. So we will not eat any pappadam those days. The way you are calculating reminds me the man who calculated the number of horses in once in England. All the children immediately gathered around her. Oh, Ajji, you must tell us this story of how the horses were counted. So Ajji had to stop what she was doing the right there and tell them a story. The story. Many years ago in England, there lived a great thinker and scholar called George Smith. He thought a lot about how it would be in the future and advised the prime minister about many things. He researched how many people would live in the country in 20 years time. He calculated how many schools, hospitals and roads need to be built or how much food needed to be grown or bought from other places to feed all these peoples. His calculations helped the government immensely in planning for the future. George often visited to prime minister's office to talk about 
some new project and advised him. One day, Prime Minister had invited him for a meeting, so he hopped on his horse, carriage, and set off for the office. Now, George was always in deep in thought and rarely noticed what was happening. Today, too, he sat in the carriage thinking about farm ships and houses. But suddenly, the carriage stopped with a jolt and he was shaken out of his thoughts. There was some commotion on the road and carriage had stopped around him. Normally, George would have sunk back into the, his thoughts and again, but today something stopped him. A horrible, strong smell. The smell that hung in the air and made you cover your nose with a hanky if you were not a scholar wrapped up in your world. Today, somehow, George wasn't able to disconnect himself what was going on. The smell kept wafting into his nose and taking his mind away from the problem he was tackling. He called out to his coachman. Hi John, what is this extraordinary smell? John, the coachman, was used to his master's absent-minded ways and he replied briefly. Horse dung. Horse dung? Now that was something George had never given a thought to. Somehow he could now think of nothing else. Soon his carriage put up into the front of Prime Minister's house but George kept sitting inside, lost in thoughts. Finally, John tapped on the window to tell the master that they had reached their destination. George walked to the visitor's room, still thinking. He was sitting there, reflection of horses and their dung, when the Prime Minister's secretary came to meet him. Now, Adam, the secretary, was not as learned as George, but he was very sharp and intelligent. He greeted George and said him apologetically. The Prime, Prime Minister had to make time for another important meeting and will be late seeing in you. I hope you don't mind waiting. George kept out staring of the windows, watching yet more horse-drawn carriage rushing up and down the road. Thinking he had perhaps not heard, Adam cleared his throat and repeated loudly, Mr. Smith, the PM! Yes, I heard you, Adam, George mumbled. Worried this great thinker of the country was in some trouble, Adam asked gingerly, Is something bothering you? Perhaps I could help? George looked at him excitedly. You don't know, I am just looking into the future and realized we will all die about a hundred years. Our country will be destroyed, our ways of life gone forever. And do you know why? All because of horse and their dung. Adam stared at George, puzzled. Surely he could not be serious. George continued, See, now we use horse as the principal mode of transport in our country. They are used to draw carriage in the king's stables and even in the farms. Adam nodded. This was true. So how many horses are there now? Let's assume there are 500 rich families who can't afford to own a horse carriage. Each family, if have two children and all of them are rich enough to own carriage, that will mean minimum two more carriage in a few years. Each carriage will require two horses. So each family would be using four horses at least. So there will be 2,000 horses. If you add to our king's cavalry and the number of horses in farm, farm, the numbers increase substantially. Adam nodded. Yes, this sounded true enough, but what was George's point? How do we get rid of the dung they generate now? Adam answered patiently. We dig pits and empty the dung into them. George nodded. Now, that's my point. Imagine the scene of a hundred years from now, 2,000 horses would have increased to 400,000 given in the way population is increasing. This will mean more dung. And what we will do with all this dung? Human will need more space and house for farming to sustain themselves. Where will we find open land to dig up and bury the dung? It will lie at unattended everywhere and cause horrible disease. If they make their way into the water sources, it will be even worse. We will end up poisoning ourselves and our environment. We will become sick and our country will become poor just by tending to so many sick people. And finally, our way of life will die out, as we all will. All because of horses. 
Adam sat and thought about this for some time. George's thought was and the grim picture he had painted of the future was a scary indeed. But here Adam's practical thinking kicked in. What if this, these things not work exactly the way George was seeing it? He turned to his friend and said, Mr. Smith, you are not taking in account one very important bit your calculation. The ability of humans were to innovate and adapt. Many years ago, there were no cars or carriages. We went everywhere by foot. Then once we started domesticating animals and we realized that we could use them for transport too. But do you think human will rest with this achievement? Who knows, in 100 years, the other modes of transport we would have invented and we not acquire for transport at all. Perhaps we will even be able to fly like birds. George never solved his problems in his lifetime. Neither Adam lived to see how true thoughts about the future had been. Man went on to investment many new ways of moving from place to place. That horses are no longer used in the numbers they once were. Now, James Watt invented the steam engine which led to the inform invention of railways. Then car, car was invented by Carl Benz and became widely used in cities for transport. Finally, the Wright brothers showed that humans could fly in aeroplanes. With all these great inventions, the horse and other animal drawn carts and carriages are now thing of past. Truly, if man did not invent, innovate and experiment, our species would have died out, less like George and his prediction. Everyone was happy with this story. They all teased Minu. You are the George Smith of our house. Who knows one day, nobody will eat pappadums and Amma may not prepare that many pappadums. We may even buy directly from the shop if it is a small number. Minu felt very embarrassed. She hid her face with a pillow. Adi said, don't make fun of her. Foresight is very important. If you don't have foresight, then you will land up in trouble like Ramu. Who is Ramu? The children immediately ask. I will tell the story of Ramu tomorrow only. And Aji bustled off. The children knew Aji would tell only one story a day, so they eagerly waited next day to hear Ramu's story. Story number 6 A Treasure for Ramu Vishnu Kaka's grandchildren had came to visit him. Vishnu Kaka was a very good friend of Aja's. They had lived next door to each other for years. Unfortunately, his wife Vasanti Kaki had died a few years back. Though there was a cook, his grandchildren, Sharan, Suma and Divya, always prepared to eat in Ajji's house, which Ajji also welcomed. With seven hungry children to feed, Ajji realized telling a story would be good to keep them quiet, till the food got cooked. Ajji started to tell the story while peeling the cucumbers. Did you know that sometime even God in heavens get into the argument? That's what happened when one Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, found herself concerned by all other gods. Together they accused her for not one thing, that she never stayed in one place for too long. No sooner are you comfortably settled in house, do you decide leave it and off you go to elsewhere. They said to her, Lakshmi sniffed and said, That's not true. I stay in house as long I, as I am welcomed. If people think ahead and work sincerely and spend money wisely, I'll stay them forever. Unfortunately, often, when I am in one place for a while and people behave strangely, I have no choice but to leave. The other go gods poo-pooed this and they refused to believe her. Poor Lakshmi decided she needed to show them proof what she had just said. Here is what she did to show that she was correct. Remember, many humans ear, human ears make only a second god in ears. So what took to happen in the earth, the god could see only a few minutes. Story Ramu and Rani were farmers. They worked hard in their field and earned enough money to feed their children and meet their other needs. They were not rich and some time had to make to do with fever, new clothes and not very nice food. 
One day, Rani was digging a corner of a garden in order to plant a tree. As she dug deeper, there was a loud clang. Her shovel had hit something metallic hidden underground. Excited, she dug faster till she pulled out a large metal box. When she opened it, she couldn't believe her eyes. It was filled with gold and silver jewels. For a while, Rani stood dumbstruck. Then she did a happy hoop and ran home with the box under her arm. Ramu, Ramu, see what I have found buried in our garden, she yelled. Ramu was writing up accounts for the month and for a while paid no attention to his wife. Only when she came, came up to him and did a happy jig around him, he looked up. Imagine how his mouth fell open surprised when he saw the box of jewels. Soon, Ramu and Rani were the richest people in the village. They stopped going to work after all. What was the need? They told each other. Why work in the hot sun when they had piles of money at home? They left their small cottage and moved into the biggest house in the village. They had servants who worked day and night doing every small job so the two didn't lift even a finger. There was a cook who cooked delicious meals, a person to serve it, another to just clean shoes and one person to even fan Ramu as he sat on his bed and whole day gossiped with his newfound friends. When Ramu decided that village life was too boring, they moved to the big city. They had another house, more servants and a lot of fun at various parties. Slowly, they forgot the good things that had once made them a well-loved family. They forgot to work hard to help others in need or to just be nice people. They thought that with money they could buy anything, including respect. They behaved rudely to others. They spent more and more money on clothes and parties as they did not work at all. The money started dwindling. They started borrowing from others which they soon could not pay back. One day, Ramu looked sadly at his account book. It was now filled with numbers that showed he only need to pay theirs. There was hardly anything left for himself. In a heavy voice, he called out to his wife. Rani dear, the good days are over. I think we forgot to be kind of the people Goddess Lakshmi likes. She has gone elsewhere and we are left with nothing. Rani stood silently for a while then replied, Never mind, Ramu, we have learned our lesson. I now think of the days when I would work all day long and go to sleep, a tired person and sleep soundly. I would fall into a deep slumber as soon as I lay down in the bed. Now I lie all awake all night wondering which sari to wear the next day and what to do with our money. I am too fat to even dig like I did when I found the treasure. Ramu smiled and hugged his wife. We'll go back to our village and to our old ways. We will work hard like did once and we will help everyone around us. Maybe that will make the Lakshmi come back to us one day and if even she doesn't, we will try and happy to be with what we have. So Ramu and his family went back to their old home and do you know what? They did live happy after all. The gods watched that what was happening with Ramu and Rani from the heavens and Lakshmi entered and then left their house. They had to agree with her if the people of the house she entered become nasty, what she could do except leave and hope they saw the error of their ways. Story number 7 The Donkey and the Stick Ajji was on outing with her daughter and daughter-in-law Sumati and Subhadra. One lived in Bangalore and other in the Mumbai. They were returning the next day as they had used up all their leaves from their office had given. The children would remain at Shigon, though with their grandparents. Everyone was looking forward to this stage of the holidays, the children, because they would know parent telling them what to do, Ajja's delicious food and fun outings with Ajja. The grandparents too were looking forward to having the children to themselves. There, the rest of the year, it was only the two of them in the house. As Aji walked with two younger women, they talked about how difficult it was for them to manage their office and work and the children. Aji listened silently. Then Sumati said, But they are so good when they are with you, Amma. How do you manage them so well? Subhadra nodded. I have read so many books and articles to find about this, but nothing works and the way it is written in the box. Now Aji said, do not always go by what you have read in books. 
learn to use learn to use your life experience read between the lines then she grinned and said otherwise you will become like the people in the story about the donkey and the stick sumati and subhadra forgot what they were they were at the temple and clamored together what is the story tell us ajay shook her head now you are behaving like children but you are my children after all all right come join us at night when i tell today that night two mother were the first to appear to listen the stories the children were surprised to see their moms and ajay started her story arun marg was a busy road it connected a number of villages to each other and many people animals carts used it every day walking along that road a group of student discovered a rock which no one had bothered to look at it in many years look they told each other in excitement there is something written on the rock what can it mean they called out to the teacher when they examined the rock carefully they found the marking were actually little drawings one showed them a stick and and the other a donkey by now a large crowd had gathered everyone was puzzled what could these strange drawing mean asked they they scratching their heads they decided to go to the ashram of the wise sage nearby and ask him but when they trooped into the ashram they found they are disappointed that sage had gone on a long pilgrimage only his young disciple was there looking after the cows and calves they asked the disciple if he could throw some light on the strange drawings now this young man was not very bright but like many foolish people he loved to put on the air of learning and pretend to be very clever he examined the drawing carefully and minutely then he proclaimed it is very simple this is the drawing of magic stick the man with the stick is the hero of this place he died protecting this village centuries back each person using this road must worship the rock and make an offering to it the who ignores will become donkey the villagers were astonished to hear this strange explanation but they were devout people on that very day they set up a shrine around the rock they installed a foolish disciple as the head priest in charge of taking offerings and from the passing travelers the disciple was pleased with his brainware of course he did not know what silly drawings mean but he no longer had to run after the calves and get kicked by angry cows in the ashrams he could sit by the rock the whole day taking his pick of the offering to the rock and muttering a few mumbo jumbo prayers his happiness lasted a few months till the wise old sage returned to the ashram the old sage was annoyed to find his disciple missing and his beloved animals roaming around uncared for then he looked into the distance and saw a large crowd gathered by the road he went to investigate and found his missing disciple there looking happy and well fed busy accepting offerings for the rock he stood watching for a while then he walked up to the rock closely examined the picture without saying a word he picked up the stout iron rod to the astonishment of the gathered the crowd started moving the rock many came forward to help him when they had been able to move the rock they found a pot of gold under it the sage said to the people gathered around him the picture mean you had to move the rock with an iron rod and find the hidden money if you didn't you were all like donkeys you should not follow the rituals and the word of other blindly think of yourself understand why are you doing why are you doing and what you do if you had given this some thought you have recovered the treasure many months ago instead you wasted your time and money making offering to rock and helping this greedy disciple of mine become fat and make fools of you the this treasure belong to all of us let's use it to keep road in good repair so everyone can use it and go about their work in peace the villagers hung their head in shame for they realized how foolish they had been as for the disciple he had to clean cow sheds for many months to atone for his greed Story number 9 What's in it for me Arja told Anand Will you go fetch my clothes from Dhobi Anand was reading a book and said without looking up Then what will you give me Arja smiled and said I will give you nothing Why should I give you anything 
You are a part of the family. Anand looked up now. No, but that's not true in our house. He declared, whenever my dad tells me to do some work, I ask for a reward and he gives it to me. Ajja was surprised. Let me talk to your father. The joy of helping someone itself is a reward. This is not right. Dad is a big officer in a bank. Can he make mistakes? Asked Krishna with great surprise. He may be an officer in the bank, but at home he is your father and my son. I will talk to him. If you go on like this, you will become a mushika. What's a mushika? Asked Sharan. Ajja looked around. There was no sign of Ajji. Probably churning out some last minute masala powder for the mothers to take back with them. He looked pleased. Today I will tell you a story of a mushika and what happens if you want to be paid for every little thing. Mushika the mouse walked jauntily down the road whistling a happy tune to himself. There had been a storm earlier in the day which had got rid of the summer heat. He had just eaten a big juicy mango that had fallen in the storm. So his tummy was full and he was pleased as punch. On the road, he saw a twig also fallen from the tree above in the storm. Now, a mouse will store and keep many things, hoping it will be use of one day. So, Mushika picked up the twig in his mouse and set off. A little ahead, he met a potter. The potter was sitting with his head in his hand. Why? because his oven had been drenched in the rain and now he did not have enough dry wood to light it again. How would he bake the pots and sell them? As Potter sat wailing in the front house, Mushika walked up and watched for, uh, for some time. Wash up, brother, he asked with the twig still clutched in his mouth. At first, the Potter paid no attention to the strange talking mouse. Then when Mushika asked him again and again, he told little creature why he was crying. Mushika nodded, kept the twig aside and said, See, the twig has dried in the wind and can be used to light your kiln. I will be happy to give it to you. Brother Potter, but what's in it for me? The potter thought hard and deciding that a little mouse could not ask for much, said, I will give you whatever you ask for. In a flash, Mushika replied, Then give me that large pumping that, that is lying in the corner of one room. The potter was astonished. How can a mouse carry pumpkin? Beside, he was looking. He had been looking forward to the lovely pumpkin curry his wife would make for him that night. Choose something else, little mouse, he urged. But Mushika was a stubborn. The pumpkin for the twig or nothing, brother. So the porter gave Mushika the pumpkin. The mouse was delighted. He had made a mighty human do whatever he wanted. He left the pumpkin near the porter's house saying he would collect it soon and set off down the road again. Further ahead, a milkman was sitting by his cows, shaking his head. What's up, brother milkman? asked the tiny voice. To his astonishment, the man saw a mouse with bright eyes peeping up at him. Sadly, he shook his head some more and then said, The storm scared my cows and they are refusing to give me milk. What will I sell today and what will my family will eat? A spicy pumpkin curry, if you want. Surely you are joking, my friend. I have ten people at home. Where will I get a pumpkin large enough to feed everyone? Just walk back the way I came. You will reach a potter's house. Right beside that, I have left a pumpkin. That's mine. You can have it, but what's in it for me, brother? The milkman shrugged and said, Whatever you want. Like the potter, he thought, What can a mouse want? Mushika said, Then give me a cow. Are you mad? A pumpkin for a cow? Whoever heard such a thing? It's that or nothing, my friend, replied Mushika firmly. So the milkman went and got the large pumpkin and gave one cow to the mouse. A big cow with large horns listened to what commanded. Mushika the mouse could not believe his luck. Off he went, seated on the cow, whistling another happy tune. When he stopped in front of a marriage hall, why were people standing around looked sad and worried? They should be busy preparing marriage feast. Even bride and groom were standing with long faces. What's up brother groom? asked Mushika. 
sitting atop his cow. The groom replied gloomily, "There is no milk to prepare the wedding kheer. How will the wedding feast be complete without dessert?" Mushika grinned, "Don't worry. Here, take this cow. She will have. She is happy and will give you milk. But what's in it for me, brother?" The groom was very happy and said, "Why, you can have whatever you want. You can eat." your fill of the feast sweet pulao fruit whatever your heart desires the mouse kept quiet and gave the cow to the wedding party they milked the cow and had plenty of milk there was a great wedding feast after the party was over the mouse replied in flash flash give me your bride the groom and everyone in the marriage party were astonished at the mouse's cheek the groom was about to give him a good whack when his newly wedded bride stopped him you had given me given him your word that he could have whatever he wants let me go with him i will teach him a such lesson that he will never try to carry off another human bride again her husband agreed so off she went with the mouse mushika scampered ahead eager to show the bride his home but what was this why she was walking so slowly hurry up bride he called it's about to rain again The bride replied, "I am a human. I can't run fast as you." So Mushika had to slow down. By the time they reached their home, which was a little hole under a tree, "Cook me a nice meal with lots of grain," he commanded. The bride nodded, "Of course, but where is the kitchen, the spices, the oil, and the vessel? I am a human after all. I can't cook only grains." The mouse was. realized he was really in a fix having got the useless human back with him never mind at least come inside the house but how will i do that wail the bride i cannot even set a toe inside that hole it's so small where i will sleep tonight er uh, how about that under that tree mushika suggested pointing to another big tree nearby No way, sniffed the bride. It will rain and I will get wet and I catch a cold then a fever. I will need a doctor who will give me better medicine. Now she started wailing even louder. Shh, shh. Musika comforted her, thinking he should have agreed to eat his fill of the wedding feast instead of bringing the strange whiny woman back home with him. How about you stay in that temple veranda for the night? He suggested, pointing to a big temple across the road. Oh but thieves and robber will come there and try to snatch away my lovely jewels cried the woman then suddenly she dried her tears and said what if i call my friend ram and shyam to protect me before mushika said anything she whistled loudly and called ramu shyamu from nowhere a big dog and a cat appeared next to her as made up to eat mushika oh how he ran and saved his life by jumping into safety Of his old, the bride grinned and went back to her wedding feast with her faithful pets. As for Mushika, he had to go to sleep on an empty stomach that night. Tomorrow, he said, perhaps there will be another storm, and went off to sleep.